The topic of this chapter is the scope of application of IHL. We will try to answer the three main following questions. In which situations IHL applies? For how long does it apply? And where does it apply? In the next sections, we'll analyze the material scope of application of IHL. We will define which situations of armed violence amount to an armed conflict, since IHL mainly applies in such a conflict. We'll also distinguish between the different types of armed conflicts, international armed conflicts, non-international armed conflicts, and situations of belligerent occupation, as the extent of the IHL applicable rules varies accordingly. Lastly, we'll consider controversial categories of armed conflict, such as transnational armed conflict. In the last sections of this chapter, we'll address questions concerning the length of time IHL applies for and the area it applies to. These questions relate to the temporal and geographical scope of application of IHL. Both these issues are problematic given the lack of clear rules in the sources of IHL. Before addressing the, the material, temporal and geographical scope of application of IHL, two general points should be made. Firstly, there has been an important move from formal and subjective devices for delimiting the scope of application of IHL towards material and objective considerations. After World War II, the application of IHL became entirely dependent upon the existence of objective situations. As we learn it in the first chapters of this MOOC, historically, the laws of war were triggered by the formal declaration of war by the belligerents. This has profoundly changed with the adoption of the Geneva Conventions in 1949. Those conventions made the application of IHL solely dependent upon the outbreak of an armed conflict, whose existence had to be objectively assessed on the basis of the material facts of the case. This is also relevant for both the temporal and geographical scopes of application of IHL. In the past, a state of war was initiated through a subjective and formal process and was terminated through similar means, most commonly through the formal conclusion of a peace treaty between the belligerent states. Such treaties are no less common and are no longer a decisive factor for determining the end of the application of IHL. As we will see in detail, most of the rules of IHL normally cease to apply with the end of the armed conflict, that is, with the end of an objective and factual situation, when the fighting itself comes to an end. Similarly, the territory where IHL applies is no longer dependent upon any state declaration, but rather on the material location of the hostilities or the material link to these hostilities. The second general point on the scope of application of IHL relates to the politics of expansive versus restrictive approaches to that scope of application. When faced with the challenge of delimiting the scope of application of IHL, there may be different reasons to prefer an expansive or a restrictive approach to that scope. By expansive, we mean arguing for as broad as possible a scope of application for IHL rules. For example, looking for elements that would enable us to recharacterize a non-international armed conflict as an international armed conflict. A restrictive approach to the scope of application would serve the opposite objective. There are both political and legal imperatives behind both moves. The answer may vary according to the agenda pursued by the actors who pronounce on such a question.
a relatively simple case concerns international criminal tribunals. It is clear that international criminal tribunals have a great interest in supporting a broad approach to the scope of application of IHL. They are competent to try persons suspected of having committed serious IHL violations amounting to war crimes. An extensive application of IHL allows them to adopt an expansive interpretation of the acts falling within their competence. In turn, this enables them to condemn as many as war criminals as possible in order to avoid any repetition of such a crimes in the future and protect victims. An expansive approach was also favored, at least originally, by most of the humanitarian community whose members are motivated by a desire to alleviate suffering and conflicts. With respect to the RCRC in particular, you must notice that its mandate is triggered by the occurrence of an armed conflict. And if this conflict is international, the RCRC is empowered to act its mandate on its mandate without having to obtain the consent of the belligerents. There is this a clear incentive for the RCRC to have IHL applying as broadly as possible. By contrast, states have shown an historical reluctance to accept expansive interpretations of the scope of application of IHL. This is particularly true with respect to non-international armed conflicts, since states wanted to preserve their freedom to suppress rebellions as they saw fit. However, today we can see a reversal of the positions of the humanitarian community and of states. It is largely a consequence of the development of human rights law. Human rights law is generally considered to be a more onerous legal regime that offers greater protection to individuals than IHL, especially with respect to targeting and detention. As a result, it is often argued that today the humanitarian community may prefer a more restrictive approach to the scope of application of IHL, considered as less protective in order to give more room to human rights law. By contrast, there may be an imperative for states to prefer a broad approach in order to use IHL as a means to escape their obligations under human rights law. However, we should be skeptical of these claims for several reasons. I invite you to read those reasons after that video.